and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Jerry Klum. It is my pleasure to come to you today on behalf of Life University and today's chiropractic leadership. In the next few minutes, we will have a wonderful opportunity to discuss the circumstances of the chiropractic profession, the adjustment, uh, and the care we provide in relationship to the current COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to be accompanied by three colleagues, Dr. Heidi Havik, uh, the Director of Research at the New Zealand Center for Chiropractic Research, the New Zealand College of Chiropractic in Auckland. Dr. Dan Murphy of Auburn, California, very well known and appreciated lecturer around the United States and in fact around the world. And Dr. James Chestnut uh, of Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, one of the most well-known persons in the profession, speaking on the subject of well-being and the role that the chiropractor can play in that process uh, for our patients and for the population uh, on, a, on a broader level. We're going to take the next few minutes, and I'm going to ask each of them to respond to very similar questions. And what we want to try and get at is, in their view, on April 2nd in 2020, with what we know about the COVID-19 circumstances, what they know about the status of research and information about the profession, what is it that you and I as chiropractors can say without question, can say without concern about the care that we provide, its implications to our patients, and perhaps even more importantly, what shouldn't we be saying about the relationship between chiropractic care uh, and this COVID-19 environment that we're in? I'll be very candid with you. i am in been involved in chiropractic for almost 50 years. I've never seen a more critical moment than we're in right now. And it doesn't have to do with anything specifically about chiropractic, but we're caught up in this moment where the anxiety, the fear, the frustration on the part of the consumer, on the part of the public at large, on the part of nations is so immense and is so critical that anything that can be misinterpreted will, anything that can be misunderstood will be misunderstood, and anything that we say today could very well be something that winds up defining us over the years and decades to come. So the purpose and the function of this conversation is to give you a firm grasp of what you can say, what you should say, and perhaps again, most importantly, what you shouldn't say in your office and far more importantly, in public settings such as social media about the interface of chiropractic care to this problem that's before us. I hope you listen very, very carefully to our three presenters. They're brilliant, they're thoughtful, they're well studied, and they will try and parse the elements of this as carefully and as completely as possible so that you and I, when it's all said and done, will have a clearer understanding of the best way to relate our care to this moment in time. So thank you very much for being with us. I look forward to joining you at the end of this discussion, uh, following our three presenters with some concluding remarks. And in the meantime, I would ask you to listen carefully, be a good student, and we'll speak again in a few minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, this is Dr. Jerry Klum again, and we're continuing our discussion with notable individuals in the chiropractic community uh, who can help inform us 
uh, and give us perspective on where we are in relationship to the COVID-19 circumstances in our respective countries and around the world. Uh, today, we have the good fortune of sitting down with Dr. Heidi Havok from Auckland, New Zealand, uh, the director of Havok Research, uh, and is the key and, and principal researcher uh, at the New Zealand College of Chiropractic in Auckland, New Zealand. So Heidi, welcome and glad to have you with us this afternoon. Thanks, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, Heidi, well, I'm going to kind of cut to the chase on this thing. You know, we're, we're all supportive of the World Health Organization's recommendations regarding sanitation and distancing and the common sense measures that are, that are going on. And we're obviously all acutely aware uh, of the, the significance that this problem holds around the globe. But what I'd like to, to try and get from you are your thoughts as a chiropractic uh, practitioner, as a neuroscientist and a researcher about the status of information about chiropractic care and uh, the defense systems of the body. And what is it that we can say and what should we be saying in our offices regarding the relationship that chiropractic care may hold for patients at this moment in time? Yes, well, I've spent the last uh, <laughs> wee while looking into this in detail um, and, and completing a big review on the topic. So um, it's very interesting. We've actually got more research than I actually thought when it comes to chiropractic and the immune system. Uh, and I must uh, do a bit of a plug to CMCC on, on that note because they've done uh, a bulk of these studies, which is really interesting. Um, what we can say for sure in our offices to our patients is that there definitely is credible evidence for a link, a connection between chiropractic adjustments and immune system functions. But these studies are based on basic science studies. And what we're lacking and what we've got to be very careful about is translating that into clinical claims because we have no studies yet that, that look at uh, would chiropractic care prevent you from getting sick or would chiropractic care uh, reduce the symptoms of being sick or the frequency of, of getting sick. Those studies haven't been done yet. So all we really know for sure is that chiropractic definitely influences the uh, nervous system and chiropractic definitely influences the immune system. But we don't yet know what does that mean clinically for a patient in your practice. So that's where we've got to be very, very careful. Great. So that being said, um, what would you, what would the conversation in an office be uh, in the ideal sense in your, in your mind between the practitioner and their patient? So things like you could tell your patients that we definitely know that chiropractic adjustments can change neurochemicals in the body that are related to immune system function. We know we can increase things like substance P or oxytocin or neurotensin. We know we can change uh, certain interleukins, cytokine levels. So we, we know we can have an immune system effect, but we don't know what that effect would mean for them just yet. So we don't know whether that would you know, prevent you from getting coronavirus. We don't know if that would uh, reduce your symptoms if you have coronavirus. We don't know those bits yet. And this is the key difference between basic science studies and clinical trials. And it's the clinical trials that we're lacking because basic science studies really look at how does something work and is there a connection? And those studies, we've actually got quite a few. So we know chiropractic care influences the nervous system, and in particular, very important parts of the nervous system that are known to influence the immune system. And there's direct studies that show that chiropractic adjustments change immune system functions. So the connection is for sure, those, those basic science studies, the, the mechanism. So we know that there is a connection, but we don't yet know whether that means that you will and not get sick uh, or be less sick or recover faster because those clinical trials just simply haven't been done. It could be that we can help with that, but we just don't know because those clinical trials haven't been done. Right, right, right. Uh, and unfortunately or fortunately, depending on, I guess, your point of view, is that the, the, they haven't been done successfully in medicine either. Uh, is that no one has a, a handle on uh, an appropriate treatment or a recommended treatment uh, in relationship uh, to this virus uh, at this, this point in time. 
Um, so there are, I'm sorry. There are, there are obviously studies in the, in the medical world that look at viruses in general, and there's quite a bit that's known about that. But obviously, I'm assuming you're relating to COVID-19. Yeah. No, no studies have been done on COVID-19. But I, I was thinking in general, basically, with the immune system. Right. I mean, obviously, no studies at all on the connection between chiropractic and COVID-19, you know, full stop. Absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're on the same page on that for sure. Okay, yeah. so Heidi, what I'd also like to, to talk about in a, in a related sense um, is the, um, the things, you, you've written a great deal about stress uh, in, in, in your work. Uh, and the relationship of, uh, of sympathetic tone or parasympathetic suppression uh, and its effect upon uh, the, 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 the patient and, and, and their circumstances. Um, I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, but it is wall to wall, 24 seven, radio, TV, streaming, everything, uh, you know. Can you speak to the, to the issue in general Yep. of stress in relationship to immune function. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really quite sad. And because not only the stress in, in relation to, you know, getting this virus and then what does that mean, but also a lot of people are losing their jobs. So there's massive amounts of financial stress. People are losing their homes, you know, because they suddenly can't pay their rent. So, so stress at the moment is going to skyrocket. And that's something that I think we chiropractors need to be acutely aware of because that stress is so incredibly detrimental for our brain function, we know that stress will turn off the rational reasoning part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex. And we also know that it, we know that it activates the, the limbic systems, the, the, the panic systems in our brains, uh, the danger warning signals, uh, they get elevated or, or heightened. We know that this also activates our sympathetic nervous system. And we also know that it activates our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And both of these, the autonomic nervous system and the, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, are both highly involved in the neuroimmune connection. Because the way the brain operates or the way the body operates is that it has these little clusters of immune cells, nerve cells, and glial cells. They're called neuroimmune cell units or cell clusters. And they're scattered throughout the body to sense what's going on in your body if there's some invading pathogen or stress or trauma. If they detect anything like that, they will signal this to the brain in two main ways. One direct way via the afferent fibers in the vagus nerve, so that parasympathetic nervous system. It's really a massive sensory system for the brain to figure out what's going on in the body. But these little cytokines that are released if there is a pathogen or a local inflammatory process somewhere can also go via the circulation up to these little centri these little uh, parts of the brain where it can cross the blood-brain barrier. And again, the brain is notified that there is inflammation happening in the body. What the body then will do is activate two main systems. One is the sympathetic nervous system. So it can directly activate the sympathetic nervous system and releases and norepinephrine, and this influences the, the local immune response. You can also activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So these are both the divisions of the autonomic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system, this is the efferent fibers of the vagus nerve. And this is known as our anticholinergic or our cholinergic anti-inflammatory system. So again, keeps things in balance. But the brain also has an endocrine response and it can activate the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and release cortisol. And the sympathetic nervous system can also directly activate that adrenal gland and help release um, uh, adrenaline. So these are the ways that the nervous system balances out the immune response that happens in the body. And the key here is balance <laughs> and keeping this all under uh, an appropriate response because you don't actually want too much inflammation but you also don't want too little inflammation because too little inflammation can make you more susceptible to diseases and cancers and a whole host of things. But we also know that too much inflammation is associated with a whole host of chronic diseases today, which I've talked a lot about before. So it's very, very important, this balance. And what's really interesting is that prefrontal cortex, cortex 
this part just behind our forehead, is extremely important in balancing the autonomic nervous system and in controlling that hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis of the immune system. And we know therefore that it's, it's vitally involved in our immune system full stop. And stress turns that part of the brain off. So this is where we, we think a lot of uh, neuroimmune problems originally arise from. So if you think of the rising stress that's driving these inflammatory processes in the body, turning off the anti-inflammatory systems in the body, and turning off your major controller, the prefrontal cortex, that would balance out these systems, you can see where this just heads one way. And this is where, again, we've got direct evidence that stress it increases your susceptibility from from it to getting sick, it prolongs you being sick, and it usually worsens your symptoms. So this is not a good thing at the moment. <laughs> that's an understatement of all time, uh, that's for sure. So thank you for, for that discussion. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, in relationship, I'm gonna ask the, possibly uh, the same question I've asked you before, but in, the, in, in reverse. Um, if you had to, to, to uh, answer the question, uh, give me two, three, or four things that you hope you wouldn't hear from a chiropractor at this time about this problem relative to COVID-19. What would they be? Okay, I would, I would not want to hear a chiropractor saying that chiropractic care can prevent you from getting coronavirus. I would not want to hear a chiropractor saying that we have evidence that chiropractic care would improve your symptoms if you've got coronavirus. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to hear those kinds of claims, that we could prevent it, reduce the symptoms, uh, and speed up the healing process. We just don't have, those studies haven't been done. The links are there. And it's really up to us as a profession now to do these studies. And I mean, the onus is for us to actually support the research and fund the research where we actually test those questions. You know, does, we, we know there's a strong link now. So, so does then chiropractic care prevent infections? Does it speed up recovery times? Does it reduce the frequency of you getting sick? But those studies haven't been done and that's so we, we literally don't know. So I would prefer it if, if the chiropractic profession didn't go say those things because we do not have the evidence. And, and like you've said before, right now we're under a lot of scrutiny and it's really, really important that as primary healthcare professionals, what we say is accurate and is up to date according to the latest scientific evidence. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I think that's great counsel uh, for people uh, in their offices, uh, great counsel, certainly for their social media activities uh, and things of that nature. So we appreciate that very much. Heidi, is there anything you had hoped we would chat about today that we haven't gotten to that you'd like to add to the discussion? Um, I'd, I'd probably like to just add in again that, you know, there are clear connections now between chiropractic care and the nervous system and the way it works that Chiropractic care certainly seems to enable the, the brain and body to be more accurately aware of what's going on. And this, you know, coming, there's a little bit of evidence showing that we can improve its ability to adapt. And we know now that these, these clear connections with the immune system as well. So it makes sense that chiropractic care would be a, a wonderful thing at this time. And it's really sad because here in New Zealand, we're literally banned from seeing patients. And I mean, that to me is heartbreaking because you know, the, the model is there that shows that we probably would um, help people in this situation, but I'd be extremely careful with making those clinical claims because mm -hmm. it's those clinical claims that we just don't have. Right. And other than that, uh, I'm, I'm uh, very happy. There's a lot more resources available. I know we're going to include some links for those that are interested in, uh, in learning more about uh, these connections, and we will be adding those to the end of, of this talk, if I understand you correctly. Absolutely, absolutely. Be happy to, to add any information that you feel is pertinent and important to this discussion uh, and you're willing to share. We'll be happy to, to, to make sure that they're added to this, uh, uh, to this posting. So thank you very much. Well, Heidi, I thank you very much. Uh, I wish you all the best and for you and your family and all of our friends in, in New Zealand.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be with Dr. James Chestnut from Victoria, British Columbia. And if you're a chiropractor, or if you're even remotely involved around the edges of the chiropractic community, you know Dr. Chestnut. Uh, you know about his um, activities throughout the years in terms of wellness and well-being and health promotion. Uh, you know about his uh, academic capacity. You know about his, uh, his research acumen. And you know the kind of information that James brings forward to us. And today, as part of this series, uh, today's chiropractic leadership is very pleased to welcome Dr. Chestnut uh, to this conversation. With that being said, uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Okay, thank you. Um, I think one of the, in terms of innate, just the way the immune system works, I think a lot of people are, are hung up on the concept of a novel virus is what we're dealing with right now. But I think it's important that everyone understands that the immune system is perfectly set up to deal with novel viruses. That's the whole concept of the innate immune system. So there are two parts of the, of the immune system. There's the innate immune system, which is really the phagocytosis, the phagocytes, which really identify non-self. They, they identify a, a pathogen like a virus. And then they, they either engulf the cell with the virus, they engulf the virus itself, or they reduce, uh, reduce some like, you know, reactive oxygen species. They basically, they kill it. They attack it and kill it. They're kind of the, uh, the first frontline soldiers of the immune system. And then the other part of the immune system, which is much more specific and much more organized, is the humoral or adaptive or the antibody system, they sometimes call it. But that that's involves the T cells. Um, and, and the B cells, and the B cells are the ones that actually produce the, the specific antibodies to the specific antigen or pathogen. And so that's really more of the, of the, of the uh, more specific, more robust, that's the whole, you know, that's the whole military coming in to attack this thing. But generally what happens, what's really important about this particular conversation is that because viruses like the cold virus, the rhinovirus, the coronavirus, the influent, the flu viruses like influenza virus, they have a different strain usually every year, which is why people say, if you got the flu last year, you're not gonna be protected from the flu this year. And that's because we don't use our antibody system. We don't use our adaptive immune system to deal with viruses like the cold and the flu because the virus changes all the time. So an antibody to last year's virus isn't specific to this year's virus, so it doesn't matter. What that means for this discussion is that it's really the, the are, are the function of our innate immune system that is really used to deal with, with, with viruses like influenza and cold and coronavirus, rhino and coronaviruses, because it's going to be new. So the thing that really protects us, the thing that we count on, the reason why people don't get sick every year from the flu, even though it's different every year, is because they have this innate immune response, which is able to, to either attack and kill or reduce the number of those uh, viruses in the body so quickly that it doesn't get a chance to take hold. So when we're talking about seasonal illness, we're always really talking about our innate immune system, not our antibody system. The T cells of the adaptive system are very important as well because they're part of the quick response, and, and, but, but they don't make antibodies. The antibodies are something that helps us for future immunity much more than they do for that acute crisis. Uh, and so I think that's important for people to understand because I think people get nervous about novel. You know, they put the term novel in front of it, but we're, we're, we're absolutely very well equipped to deal with a novel virus, which is why the vast, vast majority, majority of people who get infected with this coronavirus are absolutely fine. It's because their innate, innate immune systems are functioning as they should be. They don't have any antibodies. Right? When, when they're first exposed to this virus, they don't have any antibodies to it. It's their innate immune system. And in fact, the innate immune system is very important, very important for tagging this virus and creating, putting, you know, putting antigens so that the, the actual, uh, and that's what the, the, um, the T cells are gonna recognize, and it's also what the antibodies are gonna be produced for. So the two systems work very closely together, but the whole thing is initiated by the innate immune system. There are two things about an immune response that are incredibly important. One is, can we upregulate it to attack this virus very quickly or attack whatever it is very quickly? So we wanna, we want to sort of upregulate it to try and kill that virus. But the other thing that's equally as important, and this really important for what we're talking about here, is can we then make sure it's called, in the literature it would be called, is it tolerogenic? Are we making sure that we don't have a huge over hyperactive 
response? Are, do, we, do we produce too much inflammation? Do we create an autoimmune response? Do we create atopic disorders and allergies down the line? And the type of cells that are the most important in terms of regulating the response, upregulating it when we're supposed to, but making sure it's not a hyper response. And, and we also need to remember that the thing that people end up dying from, whether it's from uh, influenza induced pneumonia or corona, corona induced pneumonia, is a hyper inflammatory response in the lungs. And so one of the most important parts of immunity isn't just this idea that we think of that we have to upregulate it all the time. It's also to make sure that we control and regulate it properly so that we don't overdo it, which is really the thing that harms us. And so it's the T regulators, uh, regulatory cells called TRAGs or T regulatory cells that are the most important part of that in terms of regulating the proper immune response. And we're going to talk a bit, a bit later, but those are some of the things that are really mostly are, are at the are most vulnerable to, to deficiencies in vitamin D, omega-3, um, and vitamin A, because those, those immune cells actually epigenetically upregulate the receptors for those essential nutrients, because those essential nutrients are required to epigenetically change what those regulatory cells can do in order to properly function. So if you're deficient in the nutrients that those Treg cells require, you're deficient in immunity, in your, in your immune response, or at least dysfunctional. Great, thank you. Thank you, very helpful. And, and I look forward to coming back to that in, in the conversation later on. Uh, and that's a great segue to, to the next area that I wanted to chat with you about, is that obviously we've got a situation where uh, we're dealing with a, a virus that mankind has not seen before. Um, and we are in that the early stages of that, that response that you had talked about. Uh, and there's a few constants. Uh, the, the virus itself stays the same across space and time. Absolutely. Uh, and the other factor that's well, at least involved, this year it stays the same. Th this year, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, stays the, the same in, in this window of time that we're in right now. Uh, so, so the idea that its presence is one thing, uh, and then we look at how we're responding. We, we acknowledge uh, that, uh, unfortunately, in the world today, uh, there is no treatment for this virus. Uh, there is no cure for the virus. There is no vaccine for the virus. Uh, there, there is no um, known standard of care in dealing with this virus to, to kill the virus, so to speak. Uh, but it's supportive care of the patient and, and so on. And that, that brings us to the point that, that you were starting to, to discuss, I think, is the, the things that we can do uh, as individuals uh, to make sure that we are as prepared as we can possibly be to confront this virus. Uh, it appears from the conversation to, to be a, ultimately going to be a ubiquitous virus. Uh, with a high level of contagiousness uh, to it. And therefore the, the variable, as I see it, is that we've got to strengthen ourselves in relationship to the virus for our own protection and well-being and et cetera. That being said, can you begin some conversation about the steps you would encourage people to take to maintain that well-being? Sure. And I think that's that's probably it's, it's such a great learning opportunity right now to understand why, especially our chiropractic paradigm, about this idea of baseline health or baseline immune function, if you like, is so important at all times. And, and so the idea of health promotion, in a sense, right now is almost the same as harm reduction, because as you said, there's really no other harm reduction strategies available to us. And I think the most important thing here is to understand that the variable, that the variable determining that the level of, of uh, effect or, or burden or consequence of this pandemic is not the number of people who will be infected. It's the number of people who get infected who will become seriously ill. And so that's the main variable here. That's the, that everybody will agree. Now we have to determine what's the main variable to determining whether or not somebody who gets infected will become seriously ill, require hospitalization, and maybe require a ventilator. Because that's the thing that's causing all this overburden and overtaxing of the healthcare system, the financial system, you know, all of the things. So that's the most important question right now, which is what what's the difference between people who become seriously ill 
and require hospitalization and a ventilator versus those who are immunocompetent enough that they can deal with this virus on their own without the need for any medical care. And so, and by the way, that's the vast majority of people don't, don't require anything other than staying at home and, and, you know, resting and all the kind of stuff that we talk about. So one of the things that we have to look at, there's two variables now. One is what, what is the thing that is making people immunocompromised? And so if we look at our culture, there's a lots of things, but I mean, immunocompromising corticosteroid medication, like medications is one of those things. Lack of proper healthy lifestyle is one of those things. Improper nutrition, not enough exercise, too much emotional stress. These are all the things that, that we can talk about that can that downregulate immunity. And then some of the other things we'd have to discuss are what are the things that our immune system requires in order to function properly, in order to, to express our immune potential. So I think what's really important is most of the things that compromise our immune system, we're not gonna be able to change in an acute crisis. So I'm gonna leave those aside for now, but I want everybody to understand that there are some things that can literally create dysfunction in our immune system, but we're not gonna fix those quickly. But there are some things that we can do that can really help to, to, re, to restore proper function of our immune system, that can make us more immunocompetent, that we can do quite quickly. Certainly one of those would be exercise, but it takes some time to become physically fit. But no matter what, if you start right away and just start getting out and going for a walk and exercising, we know if you start eating better foods, there's no doubt about it, I meaning you're gonna put less toxic food into you as well. Um, you know, and we also know that if we, we, we start dealing with our emotional stress, that, that right away we can, we can make a difference for sure. But I would like to discuss something that's more, cl more clinically related, which is making sure that people are, are sufficient in their intake of the essential nutrients, which the literature is unequivocal. This is an evidence-based discussion we're having now, you know, because the literature is very clear that things like vitamin D especially, but also omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin A are incredibly important nutrients in terms of our uh, immune system, that our immune systems are literally cannot operate or function properly unless they have sufficient access to these nutrients. And these nutrients are called essential biochemically. What that means is that our bodies require them, our cells require them, but we cannot make them. Therefore, we have to ingest them or get them through sunlight with vitamin D or ingest it. And so what the literature says, which is, is, which is incredible, is that, I mean, and not, and, and not only just the basic science stuff about how this affects immune cells, that's basic science research, but there's actual randomized clinical trials on intervention studies with supplementing with vitamin D and actually decreasing um, not only the incidence of, but the severity of respiratory illnesses like cold and flu. So there's a lot of evidence out there, in even systematic review, which is very, very, you know, summarizing all this stuff and showing. And then in the British Medical Journal, they're actually saying this, this is this should be a you know a public a public health sort of recommendation that makes sure people get sufficient D. And so what I try to explain to people is, look, let's not say that these essential nutrients can cure the coronavirus or prevent. It, it's it, that's not it. What we're saying is, is that what these essential nutrients treat is a deficiency in these essential nutrients. However, what we can say with certainty is that a deficient intake of these essential nutrients, producing a deficient supply of these essential nutrients for your immune cells, makes you immunocompromised. There's no doubt about it. So if you're deficient, and the vast, vast majority of the industrial population is deficient in vitamin D, they are deficient in, 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 in pro, especially the proper ratio of vitamin D and vitamin A, and they're definitely deficient in omega-3 fatty acids because it's just not readily available in our diet anymore without supplementation. That, so the vast majority of people are deficient in these things. It's really simple to correct it um, and relatively inexpensive. And it's, and it's something that can make a difference immediately. And so I, I just think that that's one of the things on top of just a general healthy lifestyle, that's one very specific thing to do with immunity that chiropractors can be talking about and should be talking about, in my opinion. Great, great, great advice, great counsel, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> James, from your perspective, if, if I were your patient in your office um, in Victoria and um, I, I was in your office and, and I just got my adjustment and, and we were talking about my concerns and fears about this whole milieu, um, what, what would your advice be? What would your counsel be to me as a patient? And what do you recommend the guy or gal uh, working over an adjusting table 
uh, the conver what's the conversation they should be having with their patients about this entire situation? I think the most important thing is to focus on things they can control. So there are things that are going to be out of our control. And, you know, the definition of stress really is focusing on things that you can't control. So what I would say is, like, what are the things you can't control? And there are some really common sense things that the CDC and all these people are putting out. Wash your hands, social distancing for the time being. You know, all those things make perfect sense. But nobody's really talking to them about how to increase their own baseline health and well-being. And I think that's a really important role for a chiropractor. And so I think those are the, and it's also a great time to have that discussion, which is to say, look, the, the most important thing determining, you know, that, that the course of this whole thing, whether it's individually or for society, is your level of baseline health and immunity. Your level of immu immunocompetence, and, and which is really, you know, in, it, is an indissoluble union with your baseline overall health. They're, they're the same, right? They're, one, they're part of the same piece, puzzle, or the same circle, I guess, uh, parts of the same whole. So... Um, what I would say to them is, you know, in my office, what I can say, fortunately, is I could say these things that I've been telling you since you started here, the, 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 all this focus on the importance of making sure that your body, the intelligence of your body, that, 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 your, that your genes get these proper inputs so that they can express health for you because, you know, your genes are great. They just need the proper ingredients, right? So, they, you, you know, you got the great blueprint if you'd like, and you just need the proper building materials. You've got the great recipe. What I can tell you is that what you put in matters. And so, and that's something that we can control. Positive thoughts, healthy exercise input, movement input, proper movement of all parts of our body, including our spine, of course, um, and proper nutrition, that matters. And then trying to block out the things that are, that are going to harm you. So I always say, you know, no matter what, baseline health, immune confidence, it's all based on two things. It's based on toxicity, Right? So limiting the amount of negative things that go in, whether that's a thought or a bad food or you know, sedentary living or whatever it is, toxicity, and the other one is deficiency. So we have to remove toxicities and we have to get rid of deficiencies by creating sufficiency. So the conversation is, what are you doing that is going to help you have the greatest level of baseline health and immunocompetence possible? Are you taking those supplements? Are you exercising properly? Are you eating well? Are you making sure you don't have a lot of physical stressors? Are you making sure you don't have a lot of emotional stressors? And that's the conversation. But, but interesting, Dr. Klum, that's the conversation I have with my patients every day, right? Because there's nothing different about the importance of being immunocompetent now than there was before this virus showed up. Because baseline health and immunocompetence have an effect on every illness, heart disease, obesity, diabetes chronic inflammatory diseases, ulcerative colon, I mean, whatever you want to talk about, right? The, the things that we're supposed to, what we put into our body, whether it's bad or whether we put in enough good, is always going to have a huge, is going, always going to be a huge causal factor in our level of baseline health, immunity, quality of life, well-being, enjoyment. It's, it's important all the time. So that's the conversation I have. Wonderful. Thank you. Let me ask another question, and, and perhaps as we get to a close here, uh, from the opposite perspective, what are a few things that you would like never to hear a chiropractor say about this situation and circumstance at this moment? I would, I would, I am adamant that a chiropractor should never say, in any environment, but especially now, that chiropractic is a treatment for infectious disease or that it could prevent coronavirus, or that chiropractic has clinical evidence that it can boost immunity. Um, I, I, I have lectured for many years, as you know, and I can show with irrefutable evidence the biological plausibility of the relationship between a segmental problem in the spine, increased nociception, cha cha changes in sympathetic activity, um, changes, uh, you know, that are gonna to lead to hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access and increased cortisol that could absolutely, absolutely have a relationship to, to downregulated immunity and downregulated overall health. There's the, the biological plausibility argument has been won. What has not been won is the clinical evidence argument. And I think now more than ever, it's important to make that distinction between biological plausibility. And by the way, a decrease in proprioception also causes the same problems. And by the way, the literature is full of material that says even increased pain changes sympathetics and the neuroendocrine system and autonomic balance. And if you look at, you know, 
uh, uh, Bruce McEwen's work, who's literally the founder on allostatic load, who I've spoken to personally via email, who says absolutely a problem in the spine can represent an allostatic load, which can change autonomics and lead to all these issues. I, I, I went to the world's leading expert to check. So I'm just telling you, there's no doubt on the biological plausibility, but biological plausibility is not the same as clinical evidence. And so clinical evidence means that we have evidence that if we do A, this is the health benefit that we get, a measured health benefit. So chiropractic was, has never been about treating infectious illnesses or treating any illness. The clinical indicator for a chiropractic adjustment is a, is a spinal finding. That's what determines whether or not we should adjust somebody. So we would never say, you have coronavirus, that's an indication that you need a chiropractic adjustment. If you have heart disease, that's an, we would never do that anyway. And it doesn't matter what side of the spectrum we're on. If we're on both of those extremes, um, you know, would agree on one thing. And that is that the clinical, the legal and peer reviewed clinical indicator determining whether or not a patient should get a chiropractic adjustment or chiropractic SMT is a spinal finding, not an infectious disease. So my point is this, is that the wrong, it's the wrong question to ask if a chiropractic adjustment can cure or prevent an infectious illness. The right question is, can the problem in the spine that's a clinical indicator for a chiropractic adjustment, can that be related to overall health or overall immune competence? Biologically, yes. If we want to determine if there's a clinical connection between people who get regular chiropractic care and people who are less susceptible to respiratory illnesses or heart disease or diabetes or emotional problems, then we're going to have to do some clinical studies asking that specific question. And those studies haven't been done. So as I say to people, when you're talking to a patient in your office, there is reasonable, and you probably had, most chiropractors have had a lot of clinical experience with seeing people change the, their overall health and immune status, less colds, less flus. I get it. So that's a conversation you can have in your office and explain that indirect relationship with people. But it's not, a, it's not an evidence-based, it hasn't met that, that level of evidence yet. So that means we shouldn't be making public claims about it. So a public claim requires evidence, clinical evidence. An explanation inside your office to your patient requires biological plausibility. That's my opinion. And I think in this case, we're going to do nothing but harm to ourselves and to our cultural authority and, and to our reputation if we make false claims. And that's how I feel. Great. Well, thank you, my friend. Well, listen, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I know that we're all uh, have had our, our lives and circumstances uh, upended and, and turned around. And I don't know about you, but I've canceled the dozens of flights and <laughs> I've got <laughs> I've got enough credits with the airlines yeah. <laughs> to yeah. be able to fly any place I want to fly for a long time. We, we'll uh, maybe meet in Tahiti when this is all done, Dr. Klum. That's a deal. That's a deal. Well, listen, thank you, my friend. We appreciate the information, appreciate the insight and the clarity with which you've spoken uh, on these issues. And uh, we, we thank you for, for all the work you do and you continue to do. Uh, we wish you well and uh, take care of yourself and your family and, as they tell you, getting on those airplanes, put your oxygen mask on first, and uh, yeah. we'll go from there. And I just uh, would like to just say to all the chiropractors, I understand how hard this is for the practitioner. That's not lost on in any of this. I, I will, we're having an academic discussion. The truth is, is that um, this is having an enormous impact on offices and, and individual chiropractors as well. And and um, I, I just, you know, I really feel for them. Honestly, mm -hmm. I do. And so I hope this helps. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Jerry Klum, and it's my pleasure to be with you on behalf of Life University and today's chiropractic leadership. And we are continuing our discussion with notable persons in the profession about the current situation regarding the coronavirus pandemic uh, and its implications to the practicing chiropractor in the United States and North America in general and beyond. Uh, our, our guest this morning uh, that is uh, joining this conversation uh, along with uh, our, our other colleagues um, is Dr. Dan Murphy. 
if you're involved in chiropractic and you don't know the name Dan Murphy, you're not involved in chiropractic, pure and simple. So uh, Dan is internationally known for his, uh, his academic acumen, uh, his, his research, uh, and his ability to collect, integrate, and synthesize data. Uh, as a teacher, he's the master of metaphors. And uh, hopefully he'll share some of those uh, those uh, thoughts with us today regarding the, the corona situation. So, uh, Dan, I'd like to say welcome to you and thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you, Jerry. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Dan, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, the we're obviously all dealing with this. We we both live in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and we're under a uh, a uh, shelter in place uh, kind of order from the state of California. Uh, everything is disrupted, and one of the things that uh, we're very grateful for is that uh, chiropractors in California at this point, and in many locations across across the country and around the world, uh, have been recognized as providers of essential services. Uh, and as such, are continuing their practice uh, on a day-in, day-out basis. Um, and one of the areas of concern uh, that has come up in, in the profession uh, is what should a guy or a gal in their office uh, be talking about, be sharing with patients uh, about the coronavirus uh, circumstance? Um, Obviously, you know, the basics that, that WHO has put out in terms of washing your hands, distancing, so on, all the common sense recommendations, uh, you know, those, those are pretty obvious. Uh, but for you and I as chiropractors, uh, we have our element to add to this conversation and this discussion. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share your thoughts about uh, where we are and what that conversation would ideally look like to you. Um, sure. The, um, the first thing is, I would agree with you, all of the things we're hearing from agencies, um, they hold. Yeah, and it's this, this stuff I won't even repeat it because we all, you know, like wash your hands. The conversations on, in a chiropractic office, I think, has a lot more history than even your typical chiropractor understands. And that is, Nancy Appleton wrote a book. Um, back in 1999, where she profiles two individuals, um, Claude Bernard and Louis Pasteur. They're both French physicians, top guys of their era of history, and they have a very different perspective on infectious diseases. And I think that that is the conversation that we are having in our office. In fact, uh, my wife Michelle is having it right now in this office where you are taking me. If you look at the people that are dying of the coronavirus, or just people that get it, not everyone dies. Some die, some survive. In fact, some don't even appear to get sick. What is the difference between these individuals? Well, that is the topic of Nancy Appleton's book, and that is that Claude Bernard said that just being exposed is not the entire issue. The other half of the equation is host health and if you are a healthier host you tend to survive or have minimum symptoms when they look at the people that are dying of the coronavirus they are people who are unhealthy so the argument in chiropractic is let's look at everything we can do not to be exposed but if we are exposed what can we do to enhance host health and there's a slew of things that that we can do and that's kind of what we integrate into our, into our clinical discussions on these things. I think that potentially the most important of all studies pub, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine all the way back in 1991. I refer to it as the Cohen study. And it came, up, came out of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And what they did is they took 394 humans and dripped viruses into their noses that were associated with the common cold. Everyone had the exact same exposure. Did everyone come down with the cold? And just like the coronavirus, people that are exposed, some get sick and die, some have almost no symptoms at all and recover relatively quickly. 
what are the factors that allow people to recover quickly? Well, according to that study, the Cohen study in the number one medical journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine, they say it is their stress level. The stress level as measured by looking at catecholamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. They say that those that have higher levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, those are the individuals that have immunocompromised and are more likely to get sick. Now this brings us back to the chiropractic connection. Particularly if we look at studies I know you're, you are well aware of, the Agura studies, even though Agura is only the first author in, the, in one of the studies, but in both studies, the Agura studies, they, I think, were able to prove beyond any argument that what chiropractic adjusting does is it reduces the levels of those stress chemicals, specifically primarily norepinephrine. They did this by injecting people with radioactive glucose pre and post adjustments while looking at the conversion of that glucose into adenosine triphosphate with PET scans, positron emission tomography, while measuring levels of salivary amylase, which are good measures of levels of catecholamine norepinephrine. The result is their conclusion is chiropractic adjustment is inhibiting catecholamine norepinephrine. Well, if the Cohen study is right, this would mean that that approach is in fact um, an important approach to enhance host health. There's also, if you look at the chiropractic profession, which is primarily a profession that looks at things mechanically and delivers mechanical care to people, improving the way they live, exist, and function in gravity, there is historically another profession that has done the same thing, and that is osteopathy. And I would encourage anyone that is into these topics to read Journal of the American Osteopathic Association, May of 2000, there's an article by the editor of JAOA, uh, Michael Patterson, he's a PhD, and what he does is he goes back into the osteopathic literature of the 1918 flu pandemic, and he talks about how osteopathic mechanical care made significant improvements in host health and resulted in, in significant improvement in host survivability. Because of my unique skill set, I can do a 12-hour class, just in what we will do very briefly today, that we can look at so many studies that are not clinical trials, but they are studies that support the chiropractic anecdotal observations that people that have certain illnesses, including infections, tend to do better under chiropractic care. And it's not that we're curing things, it's that I think we're, we're enhancing host health. I remember my very first year as a full-time clinician, and this is my 42nd year, I had a, a nice lady, her name Paula, and she said, you know, Dan, before I came to see you, I got pneumonia every year. This is the first year I have not been um, saddled with a, a bout of pneumonia. For some reason, I'm different, I'm better on that. And the more you're in clinical practice in terms of number of years, um, you see more and more people telling you similar stories. And then when you have associate doctors and their patients are telling you that, because I've had 70 associates, and you, see, you hear these anecdotes, and that's what they are. They're anecdotes. They're not science. But what is the scientific basis? There is plausible explanations for this that are in the physiological literature. I think what is lacking is the, is the, the clinical trials. And that's just because chiropractic is pretty much self-funded. We don't have the money that other disciplines might have. But in a nutshell, that's how I would start um, this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that perspective and appreciate the distinction uh, between matters of biological plausibility and clinical trials and, and the fact that uh, they, they are not equal uh, and that they are different approaches and different data sets. Uh, and that, you know, we need to be candid and honest and, and say that uh, while we don't have the clinical trials, it doesn't mean that the uh, evidence that you've talked about from Cohen uh, forward, uh, as well as in, in, in back in history, uh, following Patterson's line of reasoning, uh, it doesn't exist and isn't meaningful. Uh, but I, I, you know, the, the other side of the question uh, that I think is important that uh, if we could ask you to share your thoughts on is, <clears throat> From, from your viewpoint, uh, 
what what do you think the 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 guy or gal in the office should not be saying relative to co to coronavirus and 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 claims that can be made or or shouldn't be made relative to chiropractic care to say that you are curing um any disease including specifically an infectious disease i think the chiropractors should not say that i mean how many chiropractors say yeah i i will cure you of your syphilis i mean that's it's nonsensical i think that what helps you with infection is your own immunological responses and i think chiropractic has a part to play in that but to say there are so many other variables um, with the individual in their health that can supersede maybe anything that a chiropractor would do that you have to be really cautious of any claims that you would make in terms of telling people that you can cure them um, i think chiropractic's greatest benefit is not treating someone with a cold but treating them before they get a cold so that they are less likely to get the cold and the cold symptoms. I know that even though my voice is a little raspy today, uh, I've been pretty much 100% healthy my entire adult life, as are my children. And when I added my children, I have 55 years worth of children now, and my children are pretty much completely healthy too, that we don't treat people so much for diseases, but we treat them to make sure they're as healthy as they can be so that their immune system um, is, is, is as good as it can be dealing with anything that they would come into contact with that is potentially um, disease producing. Great, great, thank you, thank you. Um, any thoughts that you have that you had hoped uh, we would cover this morning that I didn't get to and, and chat with you about? Well, well you know, there, there is the argument that um, a lot of chiropractic became notorious during the 1918 flu pandemic. And even though it is not as well documented as it is in osteopathy, osteopathy is 21 years older than chiropractic. Chiropractic was still in its infancy in 1918, having just began in 1895. But there is some historical accountings. If you look in the Palmer archives, the flu and you, there's some pretty good information there. Again, that is clearly not saying that we are curing people, but that it enhanced host health and people were able to survive the infection matter. I, of course, like the book by Walter Rhodes um, from, you know, the official history of chiropractic in the state of Texas. I think it came out in 1978. I think it is a very good um, historical accounting and reviewing the, the, the historical literature of the era at that particular time. And so I've always been really liking that. And then, of course, just the evidence of chiropractic or sympathetic nervous system and in chiropractic, I like the Ellen Koff article from um, Pharmacological Reviews in 2000. I like the NANCE study from, um, from uh, UC Irvine that came out in 2007. I, of course, like the Jiang study, the connection between uh, mechanical care and the sympathetic nervous system that came out in Spine in January of 1997. I think that, of course, and you always have to look at that incredible article from Nature's Review in Immunology that came out by Kevin Tracy in 2009. If you look at that, that is one of the best things I've ever seen on immunology because he has a graphic in there that shows you how the innate immune system works, which is what chiropractic really works on, and how it can make a difference. And he wires it through the nucleus tractus solitarius, which is the sensory nucleus for the vagus nerve. And then if you look at those three studies by Ian Edwards and colleagues out of Leeds University in the UK, out of the Journal of Neuroscience, out of the Journal of Chemical Neuroanatomy, out of the Journal Brain Structure and Function, 207, 207, 2009 and, and 2014, they, it all puts together stuff that increases the plausibility that good sound mechanical or optimal mechanical care in a gravity environment does have influences on the immune system and can help people with just about anything, including but not limited to an infection. Dan, over the years, I have heard you lecture many times and had the, the good fortune to sit in on your, your classes when you were at Life West over the decades that we spent together. Uh, and uh, you've always had an orientation and an emphasis uh, on the uh, nutritional needs of the, the patient uh, and the nutritional needs of healthy living. And, you know, while we've talked about the mechanical issues associated uh, with the, the, the spine, the skeleton, the human uh, in gravity, as you say, uh, what about the, the, the other non-pharmacological non-mechanical approaches 
uh, that you might uh, have a conversation with with your patients along the way? Well, there, there are a handful that I think are important. I think the, very, the most important one is the Sanchez study. It came out, I was in high school, 1973. Not really. I graduated in the, in the spring of 73. And it, I think Sanchez came out in November of 73. Number one nutrition journal in the world, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This study is critically important. We make sure our patients know about it. What they did is they gave people, they're, they're, it's a human study looking at the human innate immunological response. And they found that they could drop the innate response by the macrophages they could drop the response by half by giving them sugar. In fact, what was interesting about that, they gave me a sugar drink. But what was interesting is one of the sugar drinks they gave them was a glass of orange juice. They found that a glass of orange juice collapsed the innate immune response for a minimum of five hours and for often as long as 12 hours in a meaningful way. So we tell people sugar is immunosuppressive in that it is more difficult for the body to deal with any infection if you're doing things that are sugary, uh, including orange juice, because I say, well, vitamin C, orange juice, vitamin C, that's good for you, right? And they say, no, it actually is not. Other than that, we know that vitamin D got the Nobel Prize, and it did not it get the Nobel Prize for strong bones. It got the Nobel Prize for infection, and that's because the innate immune response is controlled by vitamin D. And consequently, when you just look around, even here in Northern California, where you and I are both from, if you look at your typical patient, they are way low in vitamin D. In fact, the new standard for vitamin D is 40 nanograms per milliliter, 40. And yet we find people routinely that are below 20. This means that they are immunologically not optimal. So we try to get people above 40. In fact, we think that people should ideally be above 50. And so this means that they got to get into the sun, which is difficult right now. It's in the 50s. No one's going to go out into the sun in Northern California, at least. So this puts us into the realm of supplementation. So we talk about supplementation. And of course, we've also known, so vitamin D is notoriously low. We just want to get it up into the optimal range for immunological reasons. We've also heard for our entire lives, all healthcare providers, the link between zinc and immunity. Zinc is involved in many of the processes of the immunological cascade for protection, and zinc is a mineral that is notoriously low in humans. The result is supplementation with zinc, at least for a short period of time, is probably a worthwhile thing to do. When we're thinking about colds and flus and other things, we're thinking, okay, let's take a little bit of zinc for a while to make sure that that facet is, uh, is covered. As you and I talked this morning off camera about how hospitals are now advocating vitamin C, we've always heard about immunological responses and vitamin C. Vitamin C is just one of a network of components of a healthy immunological cascade that would also include not only vitamin C, but vitamin E, alpha lipoic acid, and glutathione. Then, of course, we show them the book by Matthew Walker from UC Berkeley, um, Why We Sleep. He, the world's leading authority on sleep, he flat out says, if you don't get eight hours of sleep, you've dropped the, the, the efficiency of your immune system by 50%. The result is, he says, it is non-negotiable when you are sick or trying to prevent sicknesses, you must get eight hours of sleep. It's, it's non-negotiable and you can never engage in what he refers to as sleep procrastination. You can't stay up late to see something or somebody on TV You've got to get your eight hours, and it's got to be in complete darkness so that you run the melatonin pathway, which enhances the immunological response against everything, including infectious diseases. So we show them the sleep stuff. Thank you. I think that the, the, the suggestions that you've, you share with your patients and, and your community on an ongoing basis, uh, easy to do, inexpensive, um, no adverse effects. Uh, None. Yeah, and, correct. Uh, so, you know, there's no downside to it. And, you know, whether you, you view it as uh, something in the chicken soup category that, you know, it can't hurt, uh, whatever. Uh, the bottom line is something someone can do uh, to begin to feel like they are participating in their defenses and participating in their recovery on a day in, day out basis. And uh, that can certainly add to their mental health well being as, as well. So, uh, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your, your uh, taking a moment to, to walk us through those, uh, those details.
You're welcome. I hope you've enjoyed the presentations of Dr. Havoc, Murphy, and Chestnut. I know I did. I learned a great deal along the way as well. I promised you a little bit of a summary and an overview at the end of the presentation, and we're at that point. So if you'll give me a second here to see if I can work the technology and share my screen. Uh, we've got to bring up a PowerPoint presentation. So <clears throat> the first and foremost thing I heard discussed was that we need to attend to matters of law. If you practice in a state or a province or a country where your government or your regulatory authority uh, has issued demands of you relative to COVID-19, obviously you need to attend to those. Uh, the reality is the world is dealing with an infectious disease problem. You're dealing with an infectious disease problem. Uh, we don't need to translate that into a legal problem for you in your office, in your practice, down the road after this is all over with. So please respect and, and follow the recommendations or the requirements or the dictates of your regulatory authorities or your, your health authorities uh, in your particular area or jurisdiction. The second point I heard talked about today uh, by Drs. Havoc, Murphy, and Chestnut was that we need to be aware and considerate of the advice and counsel of agencies such as WHO and CDC. We need to remember that our patients are going to be getting the majority of their information from these types of sites, and it behooves us and them for us to be as familiar with this information as possible so that we can help them interpret it, we can help them put it in context, and we can help them make the most use of it in their lives and how they deal with this uh, moment in time. The third consideration I recall people talking about in the presentations was we all need to practice the, and encourage the practice of the common sense efforts, such as the hand washing, the social distancing, and mask use. These are all cost-effective, simple, sometimes perhaps inconvenient, but not difficult things to do, and they're all steps that will help prevent the spread of any virus, let alone the COVID-19 virus, uh, and to the degree that we can uh, implement them, we should, and we should to the extent possible. The next point I noted as we were going through these presentations was that we need to understand and appreciate the value and the difference between basic science and clinical science evidence. This is an important point to make sure that we have a full understanding of. Basis, basic science evidence tells us how an intervention could work. Clinical science evidence directs us as to when and where it works. Clinical science evidence builds on basic science evidence, and basic science evidence builds on clinical science evidence. They build on each other, but they provide different information and have different applications. We need to be aware of both. We need to also understand and appreciate the value and the difference between biological plausibility and clinical implications. Biological plausibility, excuse me, basic science evidence helps create the case for biological plausibility of a given intervention or approach. Biological plausibility describes the mechanisms and the pathways associated with interventions of all kinds. However, biological plausibility does not uh, get to describing the effectiveness of a given intervention. The clinical implications, the effectiveness of an intervention, are determined based on studies such as clinical trials. The next step I remember from the presentation is that we need, the, the need for clinical evidence does not reduce or eliminate the value of basic science evidence. This is a very important point, particularly for us at this moment. In the current conversation regarding chiropractic care and immunocompetency, there is important and valuable basic science evidence regarding the immune function implications associated with chiropractic care. The biological plausibility of a chiropractic contribution to immune health has been demonstrated. The clinical evidence, however, demonstrating this effect in patient populations associated with chiropractic care and immune, immune enhancement has yet to be developed and completed. It's a mistake to say there is no evidence of a potential relationship between chiropractic care and immune function. There is 
basic science evidence to the spec. It is also a mistake to say that chiropractic care will shorten or lessen the severity of a, of a given viral infection, COVID-19 or otherwise, as this evidence has yet to be developed. The next point I remember taking from the information was that we need to be cautious about the applying the experiences of other scenarios to the present moment. Dr. Murphy in particular talked about the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. And if you look at Facebook and other uh, postings around, you'll see many chiropractors are drawing considerable emphasis about this moment based upon what happened in the Spanish flu epidemic of, of, of 1918. And while the inf inf information from that time that was experienced by chiropractors and osteopaths is intriguing and it's suggestive, we simply cannot take those anecdotal reports of that day a century ago and make blanket assumptions that would apply to COVID-19 at this moment in time. We just simply can't do it. So for those of you that, that are intrigued as I am about the potential relationship that was uh, written about following the Spanish flu, we need to provide research along those lines. But at this moment, we don't have that. We need to be very cautious about taking the information from that time and bringing it forward to this moment. I also heard, I think each of the speakers talk about the idea that we need to be very reserved and restrained in social media posts and conversations. This is a very critical time. The entire world is on edge over this, this COVID infection. As a result, anything that's said is being hyper-analyzed, being put through a hypercritical lens, and we need to be extremely cautious about what we say at this moment in time. We also, at this time, perhaps more than any other in our history or in the history of social media, we need to make sure that when we offer our opinions, that they're offered as opinions and not as facts. And we need to not conflate opinions as facts and make sure that we're very clear what we're talking about. The best advice and strategy that I could offer you is to minimize opinions relative to COVID-19 at this point as much as possible. Put as much factual information out there as you wish, but minimize the opinions to the greatest extent possible. A cousin to that argument is we need to avoid speculation. We need to avoid speculation about what is working in terms of medicine, what isn't working, uh, who's at fault, what the problems are, where this got started, what the implications of it are over time, et cetera. This just isn't the time to speculate. It isn't going to help us. It isn't going to help the situation. And we need to put our attention toward making sure we understand as much about the moment as we possibly can. My hope and my request of you is to provide chiropractic care during the COVID-19 era with appropriate pr precautions as you did before this time and as you will after this time. The care your patients needed before the COVID-19 reality during and after this situation will not change much likely. Providing chiropractic care as a part of a patient's health recovery and well-being strategy does not change in the presence of COVID-19. Again, with the precautions that we'll talk to, that I talked about just a moment ago. Our care is not directed toward the management of COVID-19. It is simply our ongoing care in the era of COVID-19. And again, coming back to, to how we might change, how we might be expected to change the activities in our offices uh, in the presence of the COVID-19 environment is we need to employ the appropriate hygienic and screening protect protections for you as well as for your patients. In your office, you'll need to modify some of the procedures and practice in this era. Uh, you should be prepared with policies and pre practices in your office that provide you and your patients with as much protection as possible from transmission as you can in your office 
you'll need to modify some procedures and practices in this COVID-19 area. You should be prepared with policies and practices in your offices that provide you and your patients with as much protection from possible transmission as you can. Cleaning tables and patient care area surfaces between patients is expected as are hand washing and the screening of persons prior to ending patient care areas for fever or other obvious illness. This is also a time when you might wanna consider offering more conversation to your patients about supportive care directed towards stress, sleep, diet, supplement use, exercise, and the need for connectedness and support, as each of these elements contributes toward the immunocompetency of each and every one of us. This counsel is not suggested as a treatment for a viral infection, let alone COVID-19, but it is suggested as practical, reasonable, well-established steps that each of us can attend to for our overall health and well-being as each contributes to the immune capacity that we bring to the moment. Finally, the last couple of bits of information for me personally, take care of yourself. I travel a great deal on behalf of Life University and, and, and in the profession. And every time you get on an airplane, you remember those days. <laughs> the first thing they tell you is put your oxygen mask on first. It's not being selfish to take care of yourself. If you're not well, you can't be of much use to others. So be sure and take care of yourself. Do what's necessary for you to maintain your greatest capacity at this moment. And as the airlines would say, put your oxygen mask on first. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Life University and today's chiropractic leadership, I'd like to thank you for participating in this discussion. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ho Drs. Havick, Murphy and Chestnut for their expertise, time and cooperation in making this presentation possible. I hope you will plan to make use of the resources that they are making available through the web locations that they have identified that we've provided during the presentation, and that you'll take this opportunity to stay on top of this issue, learn as much as you can, and be as prepared as you can for yourself, your family, and your patients. Thank you very much for your time. We wish you the best. Be well.